Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another Sunday morning Bible class. I hope all of you are doing well. So last week in 1 Peter, we talked about the call that Peter gives uh, his readers to live a holy life. And this is a great responsibility that Christians have that is the other side of the great blessings that they have in Christ. Christians should be holy because God is holy. And Peter is going to continue to uh, combine these themes in our passage for this morning, the theme of great spiritual blessings in Christ and great responsibility, and he's going to apply that responsibility specifically to how Christians should love one another. Our passage for this morning is chapter 1, uh, verse, 20 th verse 22, through chapter 2 and verse 3. I know it might be tempting to just finish up chapter 1 and start chapter 2 next week, but we need to keep in mind that the chapter and verse divisions were not part of Peter's original letter. They were added later. And while some of those divisions can be really helpful, sometimes they give us the impression that a thought or an idea has been wrapped up when really there is more to it. And that's why it's important to read our Bibles looking for natural breaks in the text rather than strictly following the chapter and verse divisions. And so chapter 2 and verse 3 is where I think we ought to draw the line in Peter's thinking this morning, and we'll see why uh, that I think that's the case as we go along. But again, Peter is going to apply our great spiritual blessings as well as our spiritual responsibility. He's going to apply these things to loving one another uh, here in this passage. So again, our passage is chapter 1, verse 22, through chapter 2 and verse 3. And here Peter says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So notice that the theme of holiness from last week continues into our passage this morning, and it does this right off the bat with language of Christians purifying themselves. And this is the language of being consecrated or set apart or made holy. And notice also the idea of new birth makes an appearance again as well. We saw it in the opening doxology where Peter tells us that God has caused us to be born again to a living hope. We saw that a few weeks ago. And we mentioned at that time that this new birth is one that does not end in death like our natural birth, but leads to eternal life. And sure enough, Peter brings that back up again as well this morning. We are born not of perishable seed, uh, as in natural birth, but imperishable. And so again, Peter brings up to his readers that uh, they have new birth and eternal life, but while the doxology focused on having new birth and eternal life because of what God has done through Jesus, specifically in the resurrection, instead here, Peter has a different emphasis. Souls are purified by obedience to the truth. New birth and eternal life comes from the living and abiding word of God. So just like we've seen great blessings from God paired with great responsibility, uh, we also see the divine and human sides of our relationship with God highlighted here. Our relationship with God is not something that we have achieved or something that we have earned or something that we deserve. It is something that God has accomplished through Jesus. But it is also not something that we are totally passive about. God did not create our relationship with him all on his own. Like all relationships, it is a relationship of interaction and exchange. God has worked through Jesus to bring us salvation, and it is our response to what God has done that sets our relationship with him in motion. And so in that sense, we are made holy uh, by the death and resurrection of Jesus and also by our obedience to the truth. Now, it is not obedience in the sense, again, of earning or being righteous enough for God's righteousness to make up the difference or something like that. It is obedience in the sense of submitting to God and responding to God. And Peter's language bears this out when he talks about being born of the word of God. 
after he quotes Isaiah to talk about the word of God, and we'll come back to that quotation in a little bit, but after that quotation, he says that God's word is the good news, it is the gospel that was preached to Peter's readers. It was when they heard the gospel and responded to it, obeyed the truth, that their souls were purified by what God has done through Jesus. So when we put our passage uh, for this morning alongside what we've looked at the past couple of weeks, we see both sides of our relationship with God on display. Peter also gives us a specific reason that we have purified ourselves and obeyed the truth. The reason is sincere brotherly love. There are certainly other reasons for obeying God's truth that we can think about. Uh, perhaps it's wanting spiritual fulfillment or wanting a relationship with him, wanting eternal life. But Peter doesn't focus on those reasons here. The reason given instead is brotherly love. And this purpose, or maybe this result, really, of obeying the truth is what prompts Peter to urge his readers on to love one another. He's basically saying, since you've purified yourselves for brotherly love, then get on with loving each other. The strength of this bond in Christ is also really underscored here when Peter says to love one another earnestly and to love from a pure heart, not one of mixed motives or selfish agendas. And Peter doesn't really elaborate on what brotherly love looks like here in this passage. He will do that later on in the letter, but he doesn't really do that here. Instead, he does contrast this command to brotherly love with what love is not. In chapter 2 and verse 1, he mentions malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Love does not belong with those things. Some of those words aren't words that we really throw around all that much today. Uh, malice is a pretty vicious sounding word that means being mean-spirited towards someone. Slander is basically spreading negative press about someone, whether it's true or untrue, but, but spreading that about another person for the purpose of hurting them. And these types of things, wanting someone's hurt, speaking hurtfully about someone to others, being dishonest or jealous or simply being hypocritical, these things are the opposite of what genuine love for our brothers and sisters in Christ should be like. Peter gives us an interesting either-or scenario uh, here. He says to put off all these things, the malice and slander and deceit, put off all these things, and instead long for the pure spiritual milk. So the things that we are to put off have to do with our interpersonal relationships, while the thing we are supposed to long for has to do more directly with our relationship with God. We might have expected him to say something like long for compassion or patience or a forgiving spirit, uh, something that would better contrast, perhaps more directly contrast, with what we are to put off. But Peter doesn't give us that. He tells us instead to long for the pure spiritual milk. And I think that this contrast highlights how interconnected our relationships with one another and our relationship with God, how interconnected these relationships are. Longing for the pure spiritual milk, and we'll come back to that phrase in a little bit, but longing for this inherently should involve putting away all these negative behaviors and attitudes that mess up our relationships with other people. 1 John 4.21 is a passage that really captures this uh, same idea well. Uh, in 1 John, we read um, in verse 21, And this commandment we have from him, Whoever loves God must also love his brother. So Peter is really getting at the same truth of 1 John 4 in a less direct way and with different wording, but he's getting at the same idea in this passage. Notice also that um, our new birth idea it comes up again here with Peter really drawing out the metaphor in verse 2. And this is where we may not catch the connection between uh, the comparison to infants and new birth if we were to just stop reading at the end of chapter 1 and come back later to chapter 2. But when we read this passage as a unit, we have new birth, and we also have infants longing for the pure spiritual milk, and we have them both in one section of Scripture. And with this new birth, we are not meant to merely stay infants, but we are meant to grow up. We are meant to ultimately grow up into our salvation when Jesus returns. And like an infant is sustained and nourished and strengthened by a mother's milk, Peter wants his readers to put away all the bad things that he mentioned in verse 1 of chapter 2, and, and really all of, 
all of the ways of their former life, for that matter. He wants them to put these things away and be sustained by and nourished by and strengthened by the things of God. And he rounds out this metaphor in verse 3 by saying, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. And based on all the blessings that Peter drew out in the opening verses of the letter and the doxology, as well as the new birth and the purification that he's mentioned in this passage, um, it's pretty clear that Peter's readers have experienced the goodness of the Lord. And this reference to the goodness of the Lord, um, it leads me back to the quotation from Isaiah that P Peter provides for us in this passage. It's from Isaiah 40, um, and he says, uh, quoting Isaiah, All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. You may remember that Peter already said before this quotation that his readers have been born again, not by imperishable seed, uh, not by perishable seed, rather, but by imperishable seed, by which he means the word of God and the gospel that was preached to them. And then in, in chapter 2 and verse 2, Peter mentioned growing up uh, from infants into salvation from the pure spiritual milk. This salvation, this eternal life is founded on the eternal nature of God's word. Like Isaiah says, things in nature, grass and flowers, these things fade and die, but the word of the Lord is for forever. The truth of the gospel is for forever. The truths within the gospel, Jesus' victory over death, God's victory over evil, hope for the world, these things are forever. And our status as children of God, provided that we remain in a relationship with him, is forever as well. The word of the Lord is for forever, and so our salvation is for forever. But we weren't just saved to sit around and do nothing. We were saved, Peter says, for genuine brotherly love. And so let's get busy and let's spend our time loving one another earnestly, clearly avoiding all the things that love is not, and growing up into our salvation along the way that we will receive when Jesus returns. So thank you all for joining us this morning. I uh, hope you all are doing well. Looking forward to seeing you in worship, and take care. Thank you.